Well, happy Sabbath day. This is October 16th. And this Bible study is going to be on the flood. Now, there was the flood of Noah's day. And there's going to be a flood in the future. But not necessarily a flood of water. Now, this is going to be probably one of the most controversial Bible studies you've ever listened to in your life. And I'm not going to try to tell you what to think, but I'm just going to throw some things at you, some Bible verses, and you're going to have to decide how the interpretation is. In James chapter 1, it says, if any of you lack understanding, let him ask of God. The Holy Spirit is the best expositor of scriptures. Now, I truly believe the King James is the best version of the Bible to use in the English language. And that's what I'm going to use for modern readers anyways. There are some old versions of the Bible that are pretty good, but the old spelling, we're just not used to it. So, all right, let's get going here. I think what we ought to do is take a look a little bit at Noah's flood. Now, I have an entire Bible study, probably 10, 12 hours, on who are the sons of God? What happened in Genesis 6? You read Job 38. It said the sons of God shouted for joy at the foundation of the earth. Now, when you read the first two, three chapters of Genesis... Adam wasn't created until the sixth day after the earth was created. Okay? When you read Genesis, the Lord created the earth, and then six days, on the sixth day after the earth was created, the Lord formed Adam from the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils, and gave him the breath of life. And he became a living soul. And so who in Job 38 are these beings that shouted for joy, these sons of God that shouted for joy at the foundation of the earth? Well, there's only two explanations. And in Job 38, they're also, well, let's, let's take a look at it. You know, while we're there, you know, let's take a look. All right, turn to Job 38, 3. Job 38, 3. Gird up now thy loins like a man. Basically, the Lord's saying, uh, put your pants on like a man. That's basically what he's saying to him. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Hmm. In other words, put your pants on like a man. I'm going to ask you something, and you're going to answer me. Verse 4. Where was thou? In other words, where were you? Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have, if thou hast understanding. You know? So in other words... Where were you when I created the earth? Tell me. That's the modern translation. So, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? And if you don't know it, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. 
okay? Verse 6 and 7 go together very closely. Listen carefully. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars, the morning stars, plural, sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So here it is. He's talking about when he laid the foundations of the earth, who laid the measurements, who stretched the line upon it, the foundations thereof were fastened and laid the cornerstone. And then he says, and then the morning stars, morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. Okay? So here it is. You got morning stars singing and the sons of God shouting for joy. Now, they're talking about the creation of the earth. The found, who was there when, you know, he laid the foundations. Now, there's only, uh, there's only two explanations. One, these are angels. Or two, this is Adam and his children before they were, uh, before they were formed. And I've actually heard people saying that. Oh no, these aren't angels. Oh no, that's these are uh, Adam before he had a body. Well, it's kind of hard to shout for sing and shout for joy when you don't have a body, isn't it? Well, this is this is when they were in the spirit realm. Uh, I think that's a stretch, but you know what can I tell you? Now, in Genesis two, verse seven. Let's do verse Genesis two six. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So Adam came after the earth was formed. Okay. I mean, so it's pretty hard to say that, you know, Adam was before the earth. It's, it's a little hard to say that, isn't it? All right, so let's take a look at the morning stars. You know, the stars. Let's take a look at the stars. Here's an interesting verse, Daniel 8. Verse, oh, let's see. Uh, let's start, Daniel 8.8. 8. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Hmm. Now, how in the world did a horn wax great and cast down of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them? I mean, stars are suns. I mean, they burn thousands and thousands and thousands of degrees. If they came down to the earth, they would burn the earth up. They'd melt the earth. So obviously, this is a figure of speech because stars cannot go to the ground and nobody's going to be stamping on them. Okay? This is a figure of speech. Okay? I mean, sometimes when the Bible says stars, it's talking about stars. And then other times when it talks about stars, it's talking about something else. Let's see what we could find if, you know, find out what it is. Here's an interesting verse I just found. Jude 1.13. Uh, raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Hmm, 
raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever? I thought stars are bright. How can they be reserved to the blackness of darkness forever? Hmm. Revelation 1.16. And he had in his hand seven stars. I'm sorry. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Listen carefully. Verse 20, the interpretation. From the Bible, not mine, the Bible. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are... The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Hmm. So the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Did you know churches have angels? Isn't that wild? Uh, let's see. Ooh. All right, now we're getting into some meat here. So get out your steak knife, or sword, I should say, because we're going we to need to cut up some meat and chew it. All right, turn to Revelation 12, 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. A great red dragon. Did you ever notice in Asia, in the Orient, um, when they they have their little festivals, they always have red dragons? Why is that? Hmm, isn't that interesting? Have you ever noticed almost all the false religions come out of the East? You know? I mean, let's face it. I mean, they all do. Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Confucianism, Shinto. Um, and if you watch their Chinese New Year, don't they always run around with those, those dragon things? And they, you know, I don't know. That's if people that like, uh, that are watching all that kind of stuff, you know, next time, take a look at uh, YouTube. I'm sure they, you know, write Chinese New Year or something. And uh, look at the parade that they have. They always have a, a, a dragon. You know, dragons are very prominent. In Western mythology, the dragons were always more like a dinosaur-type deal, more like a giant lizard. Whereas in the East, the Eastern dragons are more like a serpent. So, you know. What can I tell you? All right. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Okay. So... Here it is, you've got a great red dragon, and his tail, okay, is drawing the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. Now, like I say, if these were actual stars burning with thousands and thousands and thousands of degrees, the earth would have been burned up. This is obviously a figure of speech, okay? And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be, to, to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. This man child is Christ, people, for those of you that don't know it. And the woman figuratively is Israel. And specifically, Mary, too, you know. And um, let's see. And the woman, 
This is Israel. This is the bride of Christ. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. I believe this is the three and a half years when the beast rules the earth. This is what I believe is the great tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble. Verse 7. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels, and fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels. Now didn't, didn't Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels? So who are these stars? Seems like they're angels, right? And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. Think about the serpent, the serpent in the Garden of Eden. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. See, the Bible explains the Bible. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. A lot of people will tell you, well, this is future. I'm not so sure. I think this is actually past for us. You know, but I'm it, the, the Revelation's kind of crazy book because sometimes it's talking about the past sometimes it'll talk about the present in John's day and then it'll go to the future and then it'll go back to the past so what can I tell you all I know is the great dragon the old serpent is called the devil and Satan and he was cast out his angels were cast out with him so who are these stars that were that you know and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast into the earth stars. They're angels, people. Didn't we read about the, um, in Job 38, where the stars sang for joy? Didn't we do that? You know? I mean, seriously. Um, matter of fact, let's, let's read it again. Whereupon are, uh, Job 38, 6, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Who are these stars? They're angels. Who are the sons of God? They're angels. When you read Genesis 6, and you read about the sons of God marrying the daughters of men, what do you think they're talking about? You know, and then giants? Um, you know? I mean, let's face it. This is, this is what it's all about. Oh, boy. It's almost 20 minutes, and I haven't even started the uh, study yet. Still doing, working on the introduction. On... Believable. It's just, you know, it takes time. It takes time to go through and study the Bible. It's just, you know, th these stupid church people that trust their these demon nominational churches and their pastors, and 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 watch Dancing with the Idols. I mean, you know, um, American Idol and Dancing with the Stars and The Voice and Entertainment Tonight and Kim Kardashian and Jersey Whore and and, uh, you know, football, baseball, basketball. You know, the Bible declares that the, the dragon deceiveth the whole world. I'm sure I'm, we're all deceived to a certain extent. It's just some of us are more deceived than others. Oh, all right, turn to Genesis 6. And it came to pass when men began 
began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. That the sons of God, okay, angels, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. Hmm. Do you know that every single culture in the world has legends about giants. I mean, obviously you've heard of David and Goliath, but what about Jack and the Beanstalk? What about Paul Bunyan and Babe? And uh, the Greeks had the Cyclops. Um, let's see, the Japanese got legends of giants, the Chinese, the um, Indonesia, uh, Native Americans, the Hindus over in India. I, the, the entire world, all cultures, um, the Mayans, the Aztecs, the Incas, South America, Africa even, uh, they went, Captain Cook, was it Captain Cook? One of the explorers went down to the South Pacific and uh, they heard legends of the giant, of giants from the natives. You know, it's like gargoyles. You know, you go all over the world and there's carvings of gargoyles all over the world. It doesn't matter. You go to South America, you go to China, you go to Europe, you go to New York City. There's all kinds of buildings with gargoyles all over them. Do people all have the same dream or did they see something? You know, it's... Legends just don't happen for no reason. Let's face it. Genesis 6-4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. So there were giants in the earth in those days, the flood of Noah, and also after that, David and Goliath, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were, was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And people will say that when the Lord repents and when man repents, it means the same thing. They're idiots. Don't listen to them. You know, when the Lord repents of something, when he said he was going to destroy Nineveh in the day, you know, Jonah, Jonah and the whale, the prophet Jonah, and he, Jonah repented. Uh, I mean, Jonah preached repentance. And the Ninevites, which was the capital of Assyria, they turned from their wickedness. And the Lord says, well, I repent of destroying the city. He changed his mind. You know, but when man repents, man is repenting of sin. And anybody that tells you it means the same thing when the Lord repents and when man repents, they're idiots. You shouldn't even be listening to them because they're morons or they're satanic liars. I don't know which. They're either extremely ignorant of Bible or they're sat satanic. You know, I don't know. But, but they're idiots. Either way, because they're either idiots for not knowing the Bible or they're idiots for worshiping Satan and trying to deceive people. Not that I have it all down. I know I don't, but, you know, when man repents and when the Lord repents, it's not the same thing. Now listen to this. Verse 8. 
But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Grace. Here it is. You're in the first book of the Bible. Actually, some people say Job is the first book of the Bible, but, you know, Genesis. Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Hmm. See, there was grace in the Old Testament. You got morons that'll tell you, oh, well, people were saved by the law in the Old Testament. No, they weren't. They were saved by grace and faith, just like in the New Testament. It's just Christ hadn't come yet. Okay? Verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect. Perfect in his generations. What does that mean? These are the generations of Noah. Children. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Does generations mean children? Let's see. Next verse. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Why, would the, why in the world would the Bible say that Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations? Because the sons of God were, the angels were corrupting themselves with the women. That's why. Verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. When you read about the uh, stories about the giants, the legends from the various cultures, they used to eat and devour um, the humans. You know, the cyclops and all that. I mean, they used to, you know, they, you know what can I tell you? The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, and all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Hmm. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. Now I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Sometimes when the Bible says all, sometimes it doesn't mean all. Sometimes all means almost all. All right? The end of all flesh has come before me. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. Well, if all flesh was destroyed... That would have included Noah, wouldn't it? And Noah survived, so it doesn't mean all. The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And then you can read, you know, uh, you know, let's go to skip to 17. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. Wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. Okay? A flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. All right, so... The Lord's telling Noah here, I'm going to bring a flood and I'm going to destroy all flesh. Verse 18. But with thee will I establish my covenant. Ah, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Remember? But with thee will I establish my covenant and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, 
Two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. Now, uh, let's see. Uh, you could keep reading. Actually, the seven there were seven uh, pairs of clean animals so that they would have something to eat. And, but there was at least two of everything, a male and female. Okay? All right, so please understand. Like I say, all doesn't always mean all. So let's get going here. Here's an interesting uh, Bible verse, Isaiah 28, 2. Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. Isaiah 59, 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun when the enemy, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Hmm. So let's see. Here's an interesting verse. Daniel 9.26, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall, that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Now, Daniel is one of the most difficult books, as far as I'm concerned. Um, to me, Revelation's a lot easier than understanding Daniel. But I thought that's interesting. The end thereof shall be with a flood. But didn't the Lord promise um, with the bow, the rainbow, that there'd be no more flood of water? All right, Genesis 9:11. Noah went through the flood, his families, the animals, okay? And they're getting ready to get out of the ark. Or they have gotten out of the ark, I'm not sure. But you can read it, Genesis 9, 11. The Lord speaking, And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Okay. So, the Lord says he's not going to destroy the world with a flood of waters ever again. So, when the, when, when the Lord talks about a flood in the future, he's not talking about a flood of waters. So, we've got to establish what kind of a flood is it talking about. So, let's keep reading. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there be, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual, perpetual, perpetual means forever, for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the clouds. Have you ever seen a bow and arrow? A bow has got a curve. You know, it's like a half circle. Okay. Like a bow and arrow. That's why they call it a rain bow. Because you see this when it rains. Well, after a rain. I do set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, and the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. 
And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. Canaan is a bad dude. Uh, let's see. And you could keep reading on, you know, you're going to have to do um, your own studies. But Canaan did something really bad. And uh, Noah, verse 24, And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed, cursed be Canaan. A servant, a servant shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be a servant. Okay? So I think it's pretty pretty obvious. There is not going to be another flood of waters. So what is the flood going to be of? All right, turn to Matthew 24. Here's a really interesting verse. Uh, if you read the beginning of it, they asked the Lord what, you know, what's going to be the signs of the end and, you know, when you're, when you're coming back. I'm paraphrasing, you know. They're asking Jesus, uh, what's going to be the signs of your coming when you, you know, when you're coming back? Well, let's see. Let's take a look. And Jesus, uh, Matthew 24, 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the, the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Okay. Now let's get to verse, uh, let's see, verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. Sorry, Harold Camping and the Jehovah's Witnesses don't know when the end is. They predicted it over and over and over. They said the 1800s. They said 1917. They said 1975. They picked a few days Sorry, they don't know. Harold Camping doesn't know. Okay? But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. See, even Jesus doesn't know when he's coming back. I mean, you know, if, Jesus, if there's something Jesus doesn't know, you better believe these idiots that are predicting the end, like Jonathan the Khan, I mean Jonathan Khan, you know, the Shemitah or Shemitah or whatever. They don't know, people. Verse 37. But as the days of Noe were, that's Noah, the Greek rendering of Noah, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, um, is this going to be when the fallen angels come back and start Playing with the women again? I don't know. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given a marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Hmm. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. All right. So in the flood of Noah, who was taken and who was left? When you think about it, people, in the flood of Noah, it was the wicked who were taken. They were drowned. And who was left? Noah and his family. Think about it. 
Isn't that the truth? You see in Matthew 24, 39, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In Luke 17, 27, they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Turn your Bible to Luke 6, verse, oh, uh, let's see, 43. For a good tree bringeth forth, I'm sorry, for a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. Okay? For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. You know, and that's the thing, you know, if you're saved, you're going to do good works. You don't do good works to be saved. You do good works because you are saved. You know, an apple tree produces apples because it's an apple tree. That's what apple trees do. Okay? Listen carefully. Luke 6:46. And why call ye me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. Boy, I wish somebody would tell that to the Catholics in the Catholic Church. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them. See, doesn't, doesn't it sound like you got to do a little bit more than believe? You see, what you do is going to be proof of what you actually believe. You know? I mean, let's face it. You know? Whoso cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. So you got to not only hear the Lord, come to the Lord, hear the Lord, and then do what he says. And then there's idiots that are going to tell you, oh, well, that's work salvation. You know, oh. Uh, but this is what Jesus has to say. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whoso cometh, whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. And I can show you a verse which says, and that rock was Christ. There's a verse in the Bible that says, and that rock was Christ. Sorry, Catholic Church, it's not Peter. Peter's not the rock. I love Peter. He's probably my favorite apostle, but he wasn't the rock. Christ was the rock. Verse 49, but he that heareth and doeth not, ah, so those that hear Jesus but don't do what he says, but he that heareth and doeth not, not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So, seems like, like the Jesus is actually telling us to do something, huh? You know? This is Jesus speaking, not me. I'm just reading his words after him. Boy, I tell you what. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. And there's people that are going to tell you that Peter, this, this is Peter didn't, they'll tell you, Flat out, there's a lot of people, especially those in the Hebrew roots, will tell you that Second Peter was not written by Peter. It's a false letter, false epistle. 
oh, this doesn't belong in the Bible. It's, yeah, it's, it's false. Listen carefully, because it speaks, it warns you about these Hebrew roots people. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Turn on TBN, people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily, privately, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be even spoken of. Isn't that the truth? People that preach the true uh, truths, of the true things of the Bible, they're, they're spoken of e evilly. You know, they, they speak evil of these people. And through covetousness, that means greedy, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Oh yeah, Criflo Dollar, he was crying on TBN, I think it was, that his $30 million, Lear, $30 million Learjet was just too small to hold all the people that he had to take them with him. And he, he was crying, oh, i got to have a $60 million Learjet. Because I gotta have a bigger Learjet. Poor, poor me. My $30 million Learjet's just too small. I got so many people, I can't fit them all comfortably in my $30 million Learjet. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Listen carefully if you don't believe me on Genesis 6 and the sons of God, the angels, fallen angels intermarrying with the uh, women. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And listen to this, the same breath for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah. Hmm. So they're talking about angels that sinned, cast them down to hell, delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an, 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 an sample unto those that should live ungodly. Are you listening, San Francisco? And delivered just lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government Presumptuous are they, self-willed, and they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusations against them before the Lord. Well, you know, we could keep reading all this, but uh, let's see. All right, let's, uh, let's move on. Now, let me tell you something. The flood of Noah was destruction upon the old world. But it saved Noah. It was deliverance and salvation for Noah. Didn't we read that in 2 Peter 2.5? And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, but saved Noah, 
the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, but saved Noah. You see, the flood was judgment upon the world, but it saved Noah. Now, you know, think about it. The um, pre-tribbers are some of the most deceived people I have ever encountered in my entire life. They will tell you, oh, well, the tribulation's God's wrath upon the earth. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it certainly is. And then they'll say, oh, but we're not appointed under wrath. Um, yeah, that's right, we're not. And guess what? The flood of Noah was God's wrath upon the earth. But he took Noah and delivered him. They saved him in the ark. And the ark was kind of a protection of the Lord. You know, it was protection of the Lord. All right, so we're getting to the meat and potatoes now. Let's turn to Revelation verse 12. I'm going to have to do a little studying here and figure out where I'm going to I got to find something to prove what I'm saying. Now, you got to realize something. There's not going to be a flood of waters anymore. Didn't we cover that earlier? Uh, Genesis 9, the Lord promised Noah and his children after him there'd be no more flood of waters. No more flood of waters. No more flood of water. Did you catch that? All right. Okay, let's go back to Revelation 12. We're actually getting close to finishing here. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Oh, boy. I got to have the interpretation of this. All right, hold on. Let me get to this. All right, so who's this woman with the sun, the moon, and the stars? Well, people that read the book of Revelation and then say, well, I don't understand it. Well, there's two reasons. One, either they don't have the Holy Spirit for their guide, or two, the book of Revelation draws all its symbolisms from the rest of the Bible. There's a lot of symbolism that draws itself from other parts of the Bible. Mostly the Old Testament. I mean, almost all of it is from the Old Testament. Isaiah is probably the most quoted book um, by Jesus in the, um, in the New Testament. You know, an Old Testament uh, prophet, Isaiah. There was a lot of prophecies in Isaiah, a lot. And, uh, you know, if you've never read, bothered, if you've never bothered to read the Old Testament, and then you try to read the book of Revelation that draws all its symbolisms from the Old Testament, well, guess what? I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense. Well, duh. Duh. Turn to uh, Genesis um, 37 and verse 9. Okay. Joseph, remember that dreamer Joseph? You know, Joseph was one of the 12 sons of uh, Jacob whose name was changed to Israel. Um, that's the thing about the Bible. Um, all these things just flow together. It's just, oh, I could do 20 hours of studies on, it just all leads to, it all ties together. You know, it's just, so much, and and it and it takes uh, it takes a lot of studying. People, you know. People ask me, "Oh yeah, did you go see this movie?" No. Have you seen this TV show? No. Well, well why? Well, what do you do? Don't you have a TV? Uh, well, I, there's TVs around, and I catch bits and pieces, but no, I don't waste my time with television. It's a waste. It's, it's propaganda, it's lies, it's brainwashing. You know, there's going to be a lot of people probably that are churchgoers that are going to end up in hell because they only read their Bible maybe a few hours, but they've watched 
80,000 hours of television. I mean, seriously. You know, there are some things that people can believe in Jesus and do that the Lord absolutely positively says not to do that are salvational issues. I mean, you could believe in Jesus, but if you take the mark of the beast, the Bible declares you go to hell. You're going to end up in the lake of fire. I don't care if you tell him, well, Lord Jesus, I believed in you. Jesus is going to say, well, if you believed what I said, why did you take the mark of the beast when I told you not to? Well, Lord, Lord, you know, didn't the Bible say that many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have, you know, have we not cast out devils in your names and in, and in your name done many wonderful works? And then Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Seriously, you want to hear those words from Jesus' mouth? I never knew you. Actually, the people didn't know Jesus. They just went to church, you know, and they, they heard about Jesus a little bit. Wrong things, probably, for the most part. I know what the churches teach. I went to one of their Bible colleges. I know exactly what they teach. It's disgusting. All right, let's go back to Genesis 37, 9. Not that, I, not that I'm anything special. I'm not. It's just, you know, where are you going to spend your time? Are you going to spend your time studying the Bible, or are you going to spend your time watching television, you know, or getting drunk, or, you know, I don't know. All right, Genesis 37, verse 9. Joseph is having a dream. Joseph was one of the 12 sons of Jacob, Israel. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. Obeisance means to bow down. Okay? So here it is. The sun, the moon, and 11 stars bowed down to Joseph. Verse 10. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Listen carefully. This is the interpretation. Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren come indeed and bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? Who's the sun? Jacob Israel. Who's the moon? his mother. Who's the 11 stars? Joseph's 11 brothers. What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come and bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying, what happened in, what happened in Egypt? Didn't Joseph become ruler in Egypt? Didn't his father and his mother and all his brethren bow down before him? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You better believe it. So, Revelation 12, 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. This is Israel, people. This is Israel. The crown of 12 stars, the 12 tribes of Israel. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Isn't that what happened when Mary had the child? Um, didn't Herod send soldiers to uh, Bethlehem and kill all the children that were, what, two years old and younger? Oh, yeah. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And who's that? That's Christ. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. 
and the woman fled into the wilderness. Israel is going to have to flee into the wilderness one day. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared to God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. This is three and a half years, people. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old servant called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ more than you love your life? I hope you do. Because one day you might be called to make a choice. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, anger, hatred, For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And the woman was given two wings of a great eagle. And the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, that's a year, and times, that's two years and a half a time. So that's one year plus two years plus a half. That's three and a half years. That's 1,200 and, 1200 and something, 60 days. Didn't we just read that? Um, let's see. Uh, where did we see that? Verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared to God that they should feed her there a 1,203 score days. That's 1,260 days, okay? It's the same thing as three and a half years, basically. All right, verse 14. And, the woman were, and, the, and to the woman were given two wings of great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished, probably with manna, just like in the days of Moses when he led the children of Israel out into the desert away from Egypt where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Listen carefully. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Is this figuratively or is this literal? And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that she that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood and the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth so what is this an earthquake a sinkhole and the dragon was wroth angry and the woman and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make, make war. Make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God. Hmm. So here it is: the dragon's angry with the woman, and went and goes to make war with the remnant of her seed, which is her children, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting? So these people not only have the testimony of Jesus Christ, but they also keep the commandments of God. Isn't that interesting? All right. So what is this flood? Let's use the Bible to explain the Bible. 
Turn your Bibles to Revelation 17. We're going to read about Babylon. I'm going to kind of read. Well, let's take a look. Revelation 17, 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. So here it is, you've got a great whore that sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit of, into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Okay. And for those of you that don't know it, purple is the color of royalty. Okay. Uh, let's see. Decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carried, carrieth her which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, out of, out, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Did you catch that? Seriously, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Is this saying that there are people whose names were not written in the book of life from the beginning of the world, the foundation of the world? Hmm. Boy, I tell you what, you read that to some people, and they'll, they'll call you a Calvinist. I don't know. I, I, I'm not a Calvinist because Calvin didn't die for me, and I don't follow Calvin. You know, but... So there's evidently whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And yes, Rome is built on seven hills or seven mountains. Um, but so is Jerusalem. So is Moscow. So is Seattle. Um, so is Istanbul which was Constantinople, the capital of the Eastern Orthodox, Greek Orthodox Church. So, and there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is yet, and is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was, and is not yet, I'm sorry, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom of yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Called, chosen, and faithful. Oh, yes. The Lamb. 
is Lord of Lord, King of Kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Do you know that we're called, we're chosen, and we're to be faithful? Ooh, those in Christ are the chosen people? Ooh, you want to get kicked out of churches, just tell them, well, we're the chosen people. Revelation 17, 14 says that. Listen carefully to this next verse. Very, very important. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So the waters that you that he saw where the whore sits are people, multitudes, nations, and tongues. That's the flood, people. Peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Hmm. Now let's go back to Revelation twelve. Verse 15, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. People, nations, tongues, multitudes. Does that make sense now? And the serpent cast out of his wa mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Now here's a prophecy. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Did you ever wonder why? Why um, are the governments in Europe flooding, flooding Europe with Muslims? Why? And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Why is the United States flooded with third world heathen aliens? Why? Does it make sense to you? All right, here's the really, really controversial part. But you know what? This is what the church has believed a hundred years ago. I mean, almost all the churches believe this a hundred years ago. Two hundred years ago, all the churches believe this. It wasn't until like the 18, mid-1800s, you know, like eight, around the time of the Civil War, that the churches uh, really started going down the toilet. But uh, in the last probably 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years, it's, they've gone, after World War II, uh, the church has really gone into the toilet. You know, you got to realize something. When this was taught, the churches weren't arguing over lesbian women getting ordained as ministers and worrying about whether or not they should be able to marry two sodomite men. I mean, that was just non, a non-question. All right, Strong's Concordance, Adam, A-D-A-M, yes, as in Adam and Eve, comes from root word 119, and it means to show blood in the face. As, as in being able to blush, i.e. to flush or turn rosy, be made red or ruddy. And then there's root, uh, word 120, which is ruddy. And if you want to know what that means, ruddy means 
In the French, they call it rue, uh, rouge, which means red. You ever known, or uh, blush. You ever notice women love to take rouge or blush? Ask, ask any woman, what's rouge, what's blush? They would take this reddish um, makeup and put it on their cheeks so they could have red, rosy cheeks. That's what it means, people. In 1 Samuel 17, 42, oh, black Hebrews are going to hate this. 1 Samuel 17, 42, and when Goliath the Philistine looked about and saw David. Now, remember, David was a direct descendant of Adam, and he was a direct descendant, Christ is a direct descendant of David. And when Goliath the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy, and of a fair countenance. Fair countenance means having a fair complexion. Remember Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and you had the wicked queen, and she looked in the magic mirror, and she said, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? She wasn't talking about playing by the rules of a, a monopoly. Fair had reference to skin color. So ruddy means having, the, the Webster's Dictionary of ruddy means having a healthy reddish color, a ruddy complexion, i.e. rosy red blush, just like the Irish are ruddy. And if you want to look up what Jesus looked like in Revelation 1, it said Jesus had white head and white hair. In Sol Song of Solomon 5.10, we read, my beloved is white. My beloved is white. W-H-I-T-E. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. In Lamentations 4-7, her Nazarites were pure, purer than snow. What color is snow? They were whiter than milk. We ain't talking chocolate milk, people. They were more ruddy in their bodies than rubies. Rubies are red. Their polishing was of sapphire. Now, you know, you could be white, and if you go out in the sun, guess what? It turns red. That's, you know, rubies are red. Her Nazarites were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was of sapphire. So, Adam... Was he the first white man? I don't know. You tell me. So were all the Hebrews white? What about the Christians? Where are all the Christian churches built? Are they in Japan? Are they in China? Are they in India? Are they in South America? Or are they all in Europe and America? You know? Think about it. How come all the third world countries, non-white for the most part, why do they all want to come to the European white nations? Why do they want to come to Europe and America? I mean, think about it. All your South American countries your, your, and your, your Africa, they all want to come to Europe and America. They all want to come to these white countries, don't they? I mean, now I got a question. Can Africans, can they show blood in the face? Can they blush? Absolutely not. They can't. So why is, what's, all, what's the deal with the, why all this unlimited third world immigration into the USA and Europe? You know, who printed the Bibles? Uh, let's see, Germany, Gutenberg. Uh, England, America, who built all the churches? The same. Africa? No. Asia? No. Europe? And the USA? Yes. Let me ask, let me read something here. I have two playlists. One, who are the sons of God? And two, God's covenant with Abraham. In the Old Testament, in the, especially in Genesis, oh, it was so important 
who they married. They absolutely positively told their people, do not marry of the Canaanites, because the Canaanites were tied into the Philistines, who were the giants, which were tied into the fallen angels that married into the daughters of men. It was absolutely imperative. They did not, absolutely did not want their children marrying these people. In Ezra 9, 2, listen to this. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed children, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. Hmm. Holy seed. So if there's holy seed, is there unholy seed? I think so. All right, turn to book of Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. Exodus 1, 1. Now these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Egypt. Every man in his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Ishkar, Jebulon, and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. See, God promised Abraham he'd be the father of many nations. And one little Jewish nation over in the Middle East that was created by the United Nations just don't cut it. Verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more mightier than we. Than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that there falleth out any war. They join also unto our enemies and fight against us. And so... Get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the, because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field, all their service, wherein they made them serve as with rigor. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives. A midwife, if you don't know what a midwife is, that's a woman that helps another woman deliver a child when she's getting ready to have a baby. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shiphara, and the name of the other Puah. And he said, When ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, listen carefully, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. Ah, so if, if there's going to be a boy, you kill the boy. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. Now, why in the world would the Lord do that? I mean, I'm sorry, why would the Egyptians want to do that? Why would they want to kill all the males and just leave the females? Hey, if the females want to have a husband, they're going to have to take an Egyptian, right? And Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. They have mixed the holy seed. Hmm. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. Okay. Ooh. But the midwives feared God and did not, as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have ye done this thing and saved the men children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. In other words, before we even get there, they have 
the children are gone, you know, born. Therefore, God, oh, you see, when you have a civil ruler that gives you a wicked command, it's okay to lie to them. It's okay to lie to them. See, the midwives lied to this wicked ruler of Satan, the, the king of Egypt. They lied to him. Listen carefully. Verse 20, Wherefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwife feared God, that he made them houses. See, he blessed them. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river. Mm. So when you have a son, you got to cast him into the river and let him drown. And every daughter ye shall save alive. See, he's what an evil, rotten person the sparrow is. And you notice when Moses parted the Red Sea, Israel crossed the Red Sea, and then Pharaoh and his armies, Pharaoh's army crossed, and the waters closed in on them, and they drowned them. God's a just God. People, people say, oh, that was terrible of God to kill Pharaoh and his arm, Pharaoh's army. Oh, what a wicked, evil king God is. Hey, God's just returning the favor. How many ch boys were drowned in the river? How many? Hebrew boys, that is. Now, why would they do that? Why would they want to kill all the boys but leave the women alive? Holy seed, people. Holy seed. Now, let me tell you something. China, their oldest mummies that they have found had red and blonde hair. They were white. They were Caucasians. But do you know that the Mongolians, the Mongols, uh, that's why they built the Great Wall of China. But the thing was that the Mongols just went around it because the Great Wall doesn't surround China. It just covers the north part um, on the border of Mongolia. What did they do when they conquered China? They killed all the males. Hmm. And what do the Chinese look like today? But the earliest uh, excavations of China, blonde and red hairs. They were probably white. You can you can look up look up uh, Caucasian um, remains in China. There, it's well documented. Matter of fact, the Chinese government called in, um, I think it was the French, English, or the Germans, I forget which, to help them excavate some of these old um, tombs because, you know, they didn't have the experience that the um, Germans or French or English had in doing this. And they found hairbrushes with blonde hairs in them. Yes, the early inhabitants of China were white Caucasians. And then evidently the Mongolians came and killed all the males. And that's what they did. They killed all the males and then they, you know, um, you know, the women just lost their husband and, you know, some guys sitting there pointing a, a sword at your throat and, uh, you know, the women, well, let's just say that the uh, Chinese, all the Chinese are probably, probably part, part white and part Mongolian. And, uh, you know, why? Do you know there's uh, uh, at least a couple rabbis in Europe that are calling and saying that white people, the Europeans, should not be allowed to get married? White, two, a white man and a white woman should not be allowed to get married. They're already calling for that. Do you know that in the 1950s, almost every single state in the United States you know what the purpose of the marriage license was? It was so the state could examine the racial characteristics of the man and the woman because interracial marriages were forbidden for the most part. 
And it wasn't until the federal government came along and said, nope, you can't do that. That's unconstitutional. Sort of like the sodomite marriages. You know, but back in them days, uh, you didn't have churches arguing over whether or not sodomites should be able to get married. You know? Now, you got to understand something. It's one of two things. The Lord, the Lord separated all the people. He put the whites in Europe. He put the blacks in Africa. And, you know, they were separated for a reason. But it seems like Satan wants to mix us all together. There's a very interesting Bible verse. Let me find it. In Zechariah 9.6, And a bastard shall dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. Now the Philistines were the giants. They were the product hybrid of the fallen angels and the men, the women. You know, the Philistines were always tied in with giants, and they were always tied in with the Canaanites. And it was not a good thing to marry into the Canaanites. The word bastard here, the modern term bastard today means, you know, a woman that doesn't have a husband. But in the Hebrew, it's a word called mamzer. It meant a mixed mongrel, you know? What happens when you take a purebred German shepherd and a purebred poodle, you know, AKC registered, and, you know, male and female, and they have puppies. Well, guess what? They call them mongrels because it's not a purebred poodle and it's not a purebred German shepherd. They're still dogs. They can still have, you know, puppies together. But um, now listen to this. Deuteronomy 23, 2. A bastard, a mamzer, a mixed mongrel, a bastard shall not, shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to his tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. That's Deuteronomy 23, 2. A bastard, a mixed mongrel, shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to his tenth generation shall he not enter into into the congregation of the Lord. Sounds like the Lord's pretty serious about that, don't it? So, you know, who you married back in the old days was very important. Are you starting to get the idea of what this flood is all about? The flood, people. They want to flood the lands of the white Western post-Christian world. Europe and America with all these aliens. Amos 3.1 Hear this word that the Lord hath spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up out of the land of Egypt, saying, You only, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. He's basically saying, of, of everybody that's on the earth, you're the only ones that I knew. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Can two walk together, except they be agreed? Hmm. See, does the Lord know everybody? I doesn't seem like that, does it? In Genesis 24, 3, read this carefully. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom 
I dwell. Does that sound pretty serious? Oh, yeah. You know, people who our children and children's children married was very important to the Lord. Today, you know, they're pushing this third world immigration. They're, they're wanting us to be sodomites and lesbians. Uh, you know, you can, you can learn witchcraft in, in public schools, but you can't bring a Bible. Um, you know, the filth that's on TV is all about witchcraft, uh, homosexuality. It's just, you know, let me tell you something. One day, one day, if we live to see it, I don't know if we will, but per Christians, Christians are going to be horribly persecuted. And they're the ones that are going to be, have to fly into the wilderness. And I do believe the Lord will provide, well, she'll be nourished for time, time, and half a time, three and a half years, from the face of the serpent. You know, so what can I tell you? I told you this was going to be controversial. And if you believe that the white Western Christian nations of the Europe and the, and, and the United States, you know, let's face it, people, name me from 100 years ago, name me one non-white country that was first world. Africa, no. India, no. China, Japan, no. None of them. South America, no. None of them. Absolutely none of them. The, the Christian, white Christian nations of Europe and the United States have always had, pretty much always had, the highest standard of living um, for the last, I don't know, 500 years. You know, it's because we honored the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord blessed us. Well, we don't, we don't honor him anymore. We've kicked him out of our lives. And now all the judgments and curses are coming upon it. Let me tell you, people, you have no more a hated enemy than Satan and his children. And yes, Satan has children on this earth. You know, in John 8, 44, when, when Jesus was said, you're of your father, the devil, he wasn't just calling them names. He was telling the truth. You've got the black Hebrews, so-called, that believe, that are teaching that uh, white people are the actual children of the devil and that we should be exterminated. You've got Louis Farrakhan of the Nation of Islam. They teach basically the same thing. They teach that we are the children, the white people are children of the devil. And there'll be no peace on this earth until they kill the last white person on the face of the earth. And that little experiment was finished in Haiti. They killed every white person on that island. And within two years, 25% um, of the population died of starvation and disease. The only reason the, the few of them that survived is because they started resulting in um, resorting to cannibalism. So, you know, what can I tell you, people? Um, you've got a lot of people that uh, want to see all the white people in this this world dead, you know, and um, your Talmudic Judaism, same thing. They want us, they want all the white Christians dead, all of them, all of us. I suggest you stay close to Jesus. So uh, I told you this was going to be controversial. Uh, for those of you, feel free to copy and post any of my stuff. Nothing I have is copyrighted. It belongs to the glory of the Lord and to his sheep. 
So, you know, I'm surprised YouTube's left my channel up as long as it has. So, all right. Well, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. This is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries, signing off. In Jesus' name, amen.